and I will let you. All right, welcome everybody. Um, Welcome to today's local government education program provided by University of Illinois Extension. My name is Lisa Merrifield and I'm a community and economic development specialist at the University of Illinois. Um, today, we're gonna learn more about Illinois EPA's financial assistance programs for water quality and watershed management of Illinois communities. This webinar is the first in what we hope to be a quarterly series um, with Illinois EPA that will help us understand um, other funding opportunities and planning programs that are available through the agency um, for the benefit of Illinois communities. So today our speakers are Christine Davis and Jeff Enstrom. Christine is the manager of the watershed management section in the Bureau of Water at the Illinois EPA in Springfield. And Jeff works in the non-point unit in the Bureau of Water at Illinois EPA. Both have over 20 years of experience, maybe encroaching on 30, but I don't wanna age anybody unnecessarily um, as one who's encroaching, who's approaching 30 years of experience. Um, both have over 20 years of experience working in water quality and in watershed protection in the state. So Chris and Jeff, I wanna thank you so much for joining us today and I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Lisa. We really appreciate the University of Illinois and Extension's um, support of this uh, promotion of our programs and getting it out to a group of um, entities that we work with on occasion, but we could be doing a lot more work with. So we're really excited about going ahead and giving this series of, of webinar presentations. Jeff, you can go ahead and switch the slide. Okay. So today's uh, webinar, the first one of four, is regarding water quality and watershed financial assistance programs. And we're looking at it as class number 101, the big picture. It's basically set up to give you more of a large overview of what we've been doing, where we hope to go, give you some helpful tips on how you can navigate some of the applications and grant programs that we have available. And um, just to give you an idea of what's going on, and then the next three webinars should get into a little bit more detail on the specific types of programs that we have financial assistance for. So, okay. So the Illinois Environmental Protection Agency, and, and Lisa was kind, I, whoops, too far, Jeff, sorry. Um, the the uh, Illinois EPA, um, I've been here since the early 1990s, and so the history for today's webinar is actually going to start from pretty much that point. I'm being kind of selfish and not going back even farther, but as far as financial assistance programs that, that support water quality and watershed protection, we've got a couple of different categories. The first is the Federal Clean Water Act that brought financial federal financial assistance through the Illinois Environmental Protection Agency um, to local recipients. And that started in the early 1990s. And we've got a couple of sections of the, um, of the Clean Water Act that do provide financial support. The next one that is a huge program for the Illinois EPA and the Bureau of Water is known as the State Revolving Loan Fund. Um, the last category that we have there would be state programs that are actually being funded directly from the state of Illinois, whether it was from a bond sales or some other funding source that was not federal. So go ahead and, and go to the next slide. Okay. So my first order of business here today is to talk watersheds and water quality. If you're looking at a grant program, one of the most important things that you need to know is what can the grant funds be used for? What is the mission or the criteria that you're going to be asking somebody for? And I will tell you from a grant, review, a grant application reviewer's perspective, I have a tendency to pretend the money is mine. So you have to fight the money out of my tight little fist before you're gonna get it from me. But the first thing that you need to know again is, are you asking, are you identifying the right project that I can even help fund for you or that the agency can fund for you? See, I've already put I instead of Illinois EPA. That's how long I've been with this program. Okay, but the first thing is Illinois EPA's mission. It's to safeguard environmental quality consistent with the social and economic needs of the state to protect health, welfare, property, and the quality of life. Now, when you look at our grant programs and you're saying, hey, I've got the best project out there, but it may only deal with a environmental benefit to the detriment of a health, welfare, or property issue, 
you may not be the successful grantee selected for our program. So remember when you're looking or working with Illinois EPA that we are protecting the environment, but again, we are also trying to protect the social and economic needs of the state. Now, the, the picture of the state to the left is the watersheds of Illinois. This is not the, the 51 Huck 8 or hydrologic unit code 8 watersheds, but this is showing a combination of eight digit hucks, 10 digit hucks, and 12 digit hucks. And if you're not familiar with hydrologic unit codes, don't worry about it too much. You will learn to embrace them as you work through our, our grant programs and our processes. Because the bottom line is each of those hydrologic unit codes is an area of land that drains to a water body, say a, a small creek or a lake or a major river. And as you continue to follow the water from the highest point of ground to the lowest point of ground, you're never actually leaving a watershed. So the state of Illinois actually has the Illinois River watershed right in the middle of it, but that becomes part of the Mississippi River watershed and we all drain to the Gulf of Mexico. So if you wanna know more about watersheds, I have coworkers that would be more than happy to, to share information with you. But I really want you to understand that when we're looking at the financial assistance programs that we have here, we're having to take into account what's happening in the watershed and the land that's draining to our lakes, rivers, and streams, and how that might be impacting the local water quality. Okay. Um, we are looking at both point source and non-point source pollution with our financial assistance programs. But again, some programs may only be limited to non-point source protection while others may be a combination of being able to assist with point source and non-point source. Okay. So the two major types of projects that we have um, in terms of watershed and water quality, and Jeff, you can go ahead and, and move on. Okay, so the first area of projects, and I'm putting it first because in my mind it makes sense to logically do things. You wanna plan something before you try to implement it. So when we're talking about different types of financial assistance that might be available under say the Federal Clean Water Act funding sources, one of the major categories that we try to provide assistance for and again, encourage people to do is watershed-based planning efforts. Now, watershed-based planning is done at a watershed scale and it can be a smaller, watershed or it could be somewhat larger. We prefer a smaller area just because the smaller the area is, the better you can get focused on all of the things that need to happen in that watershed in order to um, help protect the water quality and go from there. Now, with watershed-based planning, in 2013, US EPA identified uh, a guidelines of nine elements that need to be included in watershed-based plans. And this includes things like the identification of what the water quality impairment is, the critical areas that need to be protected and the practices that should be applied in those critical areas to help protect that. Now, BMPs I'll get to a little bit later. Uh, the plan also includes estimates of BMP load reductions that are needed. So if you know how much pollutant is entering a stream, what's the estimate of um, how much the BMPs that you're talking about applying can reduce to again, help improve water quality. Um, the plans also have technical and financial assistance needed identified, would include an information and education component, uh, an implementation schedule, uh, interim measurable milestones, the criteria to accomplish or to measure accomplishments, and then also a monitoring component. Now, the thing that's important about the watershed-based planning efforts is these things are done at the local level by the local community with support from say a technical advisory committee of state and federal and local partners and non-governmental organizations that have information that can help you do that. So again, one type of financial assistance that Illinois EPA has is to support the development and updates of watershed-based plans. Okay, Jeff? Okay, the second is best management practices implementation. Now, a lot of the watershed-based plans or watershed-based plans should have identified 
not only the types of best management practices that could be used throughout the watershed, but also site-specific practices that need to go into certain locations. Here's that are here today are showing a bit of agriculture, a little bit of urban in it, but mostly from the watershed perspective and stormwater runoff type things. There's a, in the upper left is a uh, pond, the upper right is a terrace system, middle left is another farm pond, uh, bottom left is a grade stabilization structure, the two lower right hand is a permeable pavement parking lot with a bioswale and uh, stream bank stabilization um, on a creek in a rural area. And then the picture in the sun there is one of my favorites. That's actually a rain garden at a childhood uh, school where when the water leaves the uh, roof, oops, I lost stuff there, okay. When the water leaves the roof there, it actually follows the rock path there into the swirl and that stays a little bit wet until the water can drain down through the ground and out from there. Okay, so best man, okay, go ahead, Jeff. Okay, so the pra traditional watershed best management practices, and the reason why I'm saying traditional watershed practices is a lot of you are government entities, and a lot of times you're looking into the loan program and maybe the wastewater treatment facilities, that type of thing. So I'm not forgiving you on that, but I my slides are a little out of date on, on capturing the bigger picture of both point and non-point source. So traditional bus management practices that could be benefiting um, anybody, whether it's a, a community that's having stormwater runoff problems or possibly even flooding problems, or maybe you've got an incredibly old uh, wastewater collection system that is getting um, more water into the system than the system can handle. These types of practices are gonna help you keep the water where it falls. So the best management practices in, in rural and urban, you're gonna have stream stabilization, both for banks and channels. Uh, in rural areas, again, terraces, waterways, uh, wetlands. Wetlands can be a 10th of an acre. They could be 30 acres. It's all in, the, in how they're designed. The riparian zone improvement is the area along, say, a creek area. Um, it helps our creeks and it reduces the stormwater runoff of the water getting into the creek and then possibly ending up in our urban areas um, by planting better plants with better root systems that are going to absorb some of the water. We also see livestock exclusion, cultural practices like tillage, no-till, cover crops, those types of things, and woodland management. And then on the, the urban side of things, we've got projects like urban or porous pavement, which could be your permeable pavement parking lots or roadways, green roofs, Again, bioswales, uh, riparian zones, wetlands, uh, rain gardens, and bioretention areas. So that's just a portion of the list that's available as far as best management practices go. Um, okay, so jumping into the types of financial assistance that are available here. Um, <clears throat> on the initial slide, I identified that there are a couple of clean, federal clean water funding sources that we have available through Illinois EPA. Um, the first that is our go-to, and most people will call in if they're talking about watershed or water quality grants, is our Section 319 grant program, which is also known as the Non-Point Source Pollution Control Program. Our next application for this program should be, deadline should be uh, the end of July of 2022. That's subject to change a little bit. Um, but basically, this program is available statewide. It is, uh, we have an allocation of about four and a half million dollars total. Our grant ranges are 20,000 to $1.2 million in size. And that's a rule of thumb from what we've been funding over the last few years. We have a maximum grant identified as one and a half million dollars, because again, if you've only got four and a half million dollars to spend in the entire state, it seems wrong to not do some type of maximum grant on it. The minimum match on this is going to be 40%, which means that if you've got a $100,000 project, we would be able to pay up to $60,000 of it, and you as the grantee would have to provide, or your partners, would have to provide up, up to $40,000 of local match, and that could be cash or in-kind services. Okay, Project lengths are normally 24 months. And the eligible projects for the Section 319 program are watershed-based plan updates or development or implementation of watershed-based plans or total maximum daily loads too. 
And this is um, due to US EPA's 2013 guidelines on what we could use the Federal Clean Water Act funds for. Now, the practices that are eligible here are pretty much everything that was listed on the slide previous to this, but it excludes any best management requirements that are required by state or federal law. So if your community um, or you're an entity that say is um, under a permitting process like the National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System, affectionately known as the NPDES permitting program, if you're doing those practices to meet the NPDES permit requirements, you wouldn't be eligible for the Section 319 program. Now, if you're an entity, say a private um, garden or not-for-profit group that's within your area that wants to do a non-point source pollution control project, they would be eligible even though they're within your permitted area. Okay. Now the 319 program, the eligible costs there include administration and planning costs, designs and engineering, construction all the way through planting, construction oversight, education and outreach, and even monitoring. Now, the education and outreach and monitoring don't have to happen if you don't have an interest in doing those types of things. It's just that originally the Section 319 program was put together as a demonstration type program in the 90s, and we've never really lost that side of things. But we've also found out that some people aren't great at outreach and education, and why make them do that if they can do a good solid project for, um, that. So, okay, I've got a question on how in kind services or donated materials can be utilized to provide match. Okay, so um, if we've got, say, a planning project going on where the plan is going to cost $100,000 and we're bringing in the $60,000 in Section 319 funds, the local partner could provide cash up to the $40,000 and pay the consultants or contractor straight off there. That would be your cash match. Or they could be providing some services or their partners providing some services as an in-kind service. So maybe your community has a strong GIS program that they could be providing a lot of the map development or um, some of the formatting of the actual document. They could go ahead and use their time with approved rates um, at the beginning of the contract to provide match for the project. Hopefully that makes sense. If not, we can come back to it um, farther into the presentation. Okay, uh, next slide, Jeff. Okay, so for section 319 watershed priorities, okay, um, the watershed maps that are there right now, we do have priorities that rotate on a five-year schedule. And the map that's on the right side there shows that um, where we do have existing watershed plans, plans that are under development or plans that are more than 10 years old, which gets outside of the, the process there. And Holly, I apologize, I saw your name come up, but I didn't see what the question was. So I will come back to you. I'll have Lisa come back to your question. Okay, Jeff, next slide. Okay. The Section 604 grant program is also a Clean Water Federal Clean Water Act program. And I will say right off the top, the applications due by close of business on January 15th, 2022 is incorrect. We have not yet posted um, the next notice of funding opportunity for the 604 grant program, um, but it should be in the next couple of months. Now the 604 program is has a different mission than the Section 319 program. Again, it's, it is the Water Quality Management Program, and it is available statewide. We normally have about four awards that are given in a year. State allocation is around 375, 400 thousand dollars. There is not a match for this program, uh, and the project length is 24 months. Now, one of the most important things about the 604 program, and we'll get into what the eligible project types are in a minute, but the only groups that are eligible for the 604 grant programs are 
area-wide regional planning commissions that have been approved by the governor, and those were done back in the um, 90s, or other entities, say like a soil and water conservation district that has a state charter that identifies that they are specifically um, chartered to do certain types of work. And again, the types of work would be what they would be eligible for, which the example of eligible project types includes, again, development of watershed-based plans, uh, TMDL implementation plan development, uh, BMP design and engineering, uh, technical assistance to uh, citizens or stakeholders for water pollution control. And when I say citizens or stakeholders, that could be a, um, say, an area-wide planning commission actually assisting a community to uh, come up with a plan for how to do water pollution control outreach and education and environmental and social indicator monitoring. Okay, so, um, okay. So this question on in examples of environmental and social indicator monitoring, okay. Um, environmental monitoring <clears throat> would be something as um, like what we do in Illinois EPA, which is actually go out and having a hard time answering, reading questions and answering questions. Okay, let me, let me get Katie's question here first. So um, environmental, monitor, mon yeah, environmental monitoring could be like water quality monitoring, where you actually go out to specific sites within your watershed, take water quality samples, take them back to an approved lab, and show water quality um, improvement or hope to show water quality improvement there. Social indicator monitoring is more of getting a handle on what people believe um, at the start of the project versus what they believe at the end of the project. One of the things that we struggle with with the side of non-point source pollution is that we don't, um, US EPA and Congress want us to be able to show that we're making benefits and making accomplishments with the, um, the financial assistance that they're providing through the Clean Water Act. And so they um, have been allowing us to show some of the benefits through increased knowledge of the citizens and if they are actually adopting practices or if they understand the practices better versus trying to show what the water quality was in 1984 versus 88 versus 2002. Because it does take a lot of time to um, get into um, the water quality monitoring show the dif differences there, okay. So the section 319 and the section 604 grant programs are both federal funds, okay? And then Holly was asking after eligibility, I think. Does that sound right? I'm gonna go back and look at a thing, okay. Yeah, Holly asked. For... Okay. Go ahead, Please go ahead, Chris. On... Okay, sorry about that. Uh, please expand on state charter for eligible entities for 604 funding, okay. So, <clears throat> US EPA <clears throat> is still working off of guidelines for the 604 program since about um, the mid 1990s. They haven't updated their information, so they're working on updating it. But the program in the past, <clears throat> excuse me, was initially limited to funds going to the area-wide regional planning commissions, and then they've kind of expanded it by saying and other groups that have a charter, or basically it would be what you have when you've registered with the state of Illinois as a entity, you identify what the types of services and what the types of things are that you are gonna be doing. So my best example of, of a, what's gonna have a charter and what's not is say like a, a local park district. They may have a charter that says, we're gonna provide recreational opportunities to um, our local residents and go from there. A soil and water conservation district is gonna have a charter that says they're out to protect water resources and land resources. And the Illinois State um, Soil and Water Conservation District Act, if you go in and read the act itself, says soil and water conservation districts should be able to do land and water resource protection planning. So if a, if a park district came in and said, hey, we wanna, a grant to protect our water resources, 
we're not going to see something in their charter that says they have the ability to develop and plan um, a watershed based plan. Whereas if a soil and water conservation district came in and said, hey, we want to do a watershed based plan, we can go back into the soil and water conservation act. Now, I'm going to step away from the eligibility topic because it befuddles me every time I try to explain it. And I'm hoping that US EPA's update to the 604 program, which is coming soon, will um, go ahead and um, resolve some of this and make it a little bit easier to, to get there. OK. Hey, so, hey Chris. Hey, Chris. Yes. This is this is Lisa. If you want me to monitor the chat, I can feed you the questions at the end if that's easier. And I want to make sure you I get through all your content. Yep, I think I think that's a good idea. I'm trying okay. to do too much. And that's <laughs> no, you're okay. doing a good so, job. I just wanted to offer that. So <laughs> keep putting okay. questions in the chat. We'll we'll answer them at the end. Okay. Jeff, uh, go ahead and move on to the next slide, please. Okay, so we're away from the federal funded Clean Water Act programs right now. And the loan program, which is also known as the state revolving loan program, is um, something that a lot of communities have been involved with since probably the 1980s and on. It, in the past, it's been broken into water pollution control loans, which is mostly wastewater projects, like building a wastewater treatment facility. And the second category being public water supply loans, which is drinking water projects. Um, these loans are used to design and construct a wide variety of projects for water quality in terms of human health, and failing water infrastructure. Now you see a red asterisk up there as far as stormwater projects. About 2013, Illinois was working on trying to expand the loan program to, to address stormwater projects that communities might be interested in. So Jeff, if you'd go ahead and go to the next slide. Okay. So in the past, the normal recipient was limited to the local government who owned, operated, and maintained the assets, okay? And the state revolving loan funds, again, a very low interest loan, maybe one and a half to 2%. Um, and it was, it could be anywhere from a 10 to a 30 year repayment process, okay? So now as they've expanded the program, those traditional opportunities are still there to uh, build or update and improve wastewater treatment facilities, drinking water supplies, also wastewater collection systems. So I had somebody call today that was asking about things like slip lining for wastewater um, systems. They, um, those types of things are eligible. Um, the additional practice or project program that might be available here to, that you guys might be interested in is the stormwater side of the projects. These can include things like green infrastructure projects throughout your service area. It could be rain gardens, stream bank stabilization, permeable pavement, bioretention. Um, it can also include water and energy efficiency improvements, and there's other activities as directed by federal law. But bottom line is we could have a community that's gone out and done a watershed based plan and say they're trying to protect their drinking water supply. The practices that they have there in the watershed that they've hopefully identified in a watershed based plan, they could apply for a low interest loan to go ahead and implement some of the projects that are being proposed. Now, most people will say, why do I want a loan if I can get a grant? Um, that's a very good question, but the people that I'm talking to lately, a lot of them are spending a lot of their annual working budgets on repairing and replacing things that have been damaged by excess stormwater runoff or, um, or erosion problems, things along the lines of that. So it's possible that somebody could bring a project in, say a 30 year project where they actually get the loan to do both design and implementation of the project. They do the majority of the work up front, and then the money that they would have been spending trying to repair things that are going badly in the community, they could be using to repay the loan. So they may come out ahead in the long run. Each of the communities would have to look at that a little bit differently. Now, one thing in order to be eligible for the loan program, you have to be able to identify a secure repayment 
um, process. So in some communities, it might be a, a water revenue fee, something along the lines of that. Um, but it is something that could be of benefit to a community to say, we want to fix as much as we can right up front and then go ahead and um, see the benefits over the fact that they aren't having a community struggling with flooding or um, erosion problems or their drinking water supply filling in and needing to be dredged out over the long run. Now, the important thing with this is this is definitely not a program that I spend time with. So your first step would be to talk to somebody at Illinois EPA's infrastructure financial assistance section. And then what they're going to tell you their next step is, is to develop a project plan, which includes environmental sign off and funding nomination forms. So Jeff. Okay. The next project that, or the program that I have listed here is a state funded program. It is funded through Build Illinois bond fund sales. Um, the first round of GIGO or the green infrastructure grant opportunities um, came out almost two years ago. We're getting ready to post another round of funding, but we don't know exactly when that's gonna happen. Now the bottom line on the green infrastructure grant opportunities is there's four pieces to it. Uh, and it is statewide available. It's set up to install green infrastructure practices to reduce stormwater runoff, to reduce flooding, to protect Illinois rivers, lakes, and streams. So if you don't have those four things, green infrastructure, reduced stormwater runoff, reduced flooding, and a water quality problem in an Illinois river, lake, or stream, you're not gonna be a high priority for the green infrastructure program. The grants range from $75,000 to $2.5 million. Uh, there's a minimum match of 25%, although we do right now have it identified that disadvantaged areas can go as low as 15% of the match. Um, this is BMP implementation with limited design costs. The practices can be single BMPs, treatment trains, which would be a BMP linked to a next BMP, like a, say, a permeable pavement parking lot that drains to a wetland uh, through a bioswale, or it could also be watershed-wide projects where you say maybe, hey, I wanna do 30 rain gardens throughout this area to keep the rainfall where it falls. Ineligible costs for GIGO include land acquisition, BMPs for new development. So if you've got something new happening, we're not gonna be able to help you with that, like a new building or a new parking lot. Um, we can be replacing something, but we can't be adding something. Uh, project administration, routine operation and maintenance, education and outreach, and monitoring are all not eligible. Next slide, Jeff. Okay. Another Illinois EPA um, state-funded initiative is the Unsewered Communities Program. This, they're in the second round of funding, I believe, for the Unsewered Community Planning Grant. Uh, basically, uh, unsewered community, there's about 200 of them in the state of Illinois. And when they say communities, it could even be as small as a subdivision. Um, so um, there's, there's up to $30,000 in grant funds with no match required for, to help a, a small community develop a project plan to address the collection of the wastewater. And then there's a follow-up program that allows construction costs for unsewered communities um, once they've been approved, when they're, once their plan has been approved. Now with the unsewered communities program, because there isn't a lot of money and there's so many groups that need that assistance, the idea is to get the unsewered community attached to a neighboring community that already has a treatment system in place. So don't look at the unsewered community program as a way to get funding to put in a, say, a wastewater treatment plant. Okay, Jeff, next. Okay, I'm switching over to the Grant Accountability and Transparency Act side of the presentation. Today, we've got four topics basically going on here. Um, the GATA process, or I'm sorry, the GATA Act, Grant Accountability and Transparency Act, really started to kick into gear around 2015. The idea behind it is any of the state agencies that are administering state or federal grant funds should be consistent with the other state agencies to ask for and require the same types of applications, the same types of reporting, 
and making sure that everybody's eligible in the same way. The screenshot that's here shows you a couple of pages out of the, the GATA portal. Um, the one thing that I would say, um, well, I guess a couple things I'd say here is GATA does not require any new requirements. These are all things that have been required by the federal government or state government since the early 90s. It's just that we've finally gotten our act together and have decided to make sure that everybody is doing it the same way versus, versus some agencies asking for things, some agencies not asking for things. Um, as you're getting into GATA, it seems like a lot of extra work, but I'm seeing the benefits from working with people that have worked with us on a regular basis where we're starting to see consistency again between the types of applications that happen and the application process. Next slide, Jeff. Okay, so GATA again, the process is gonna be that in, you have to go into the GATA portal. You're gonna be finding our notice of funding opportunities. So any of the federal or state programs that I just talked about other than the loan program will have an announcement out there that stays out there from anywhere from two weeks to six weeks saying, hey, the state of Illinois or such and such agency has funding available go ahead and apply for it. Um, we go through, we receive the applications, we review them, we, we rank the projects out. Um, and then for the projects that are selected, we end up providing a notice of state award that if the grantee accepts, then we would go ahead and develop a grant agreement, which gets executed by Illinois EPA and the grantee. And I know I just, leapfrogged over like eight things there, but I think there's some better information a little bit later on. So Jeff, next slide. Okay, so one thing with the Grant Accountability and Transparency Act, and that's the website for it there, grants.illinois.gov, there's a pre-application requirements and there's pre-award requirements. So if you're interested in any of our grant funds, you have to go into the GATA portal and identify that you are existing, which is the authentication down there. Um, that is a matter of just putting an email in there and saying, hey, yeah, I'm alive, I'm, I'm interested. Then the grantee registration is where you go in and actually put information in there about your organization. Um, you know, are you a municipality? Are you a not-for-profit? What are your um, federal codes, like your federal employee identification number, DUNS number, things like that. Um, and so there's a number of things that you have to do, go in and register. And then once you're registered in the GATA portal, the, the state reviews your information to confirm that you're actually eligible to apply for um, grants through the GATA portal or through Illinois EPA. Then on the pre-award requirements, the last two bullets there are the fiscal and administrative risk assessment and a programmatic risk assessment. Those are some more questions that once they determine that you're a viable entity, um, then you would go in and tell them more information about how you manage fiscally and administratively your programs. How do you deal with your invoices? How do you do your quarterly reporting? How do you, you know, manage things like that? We get that information and that helps us identify additional items that need to go into the contract. And at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Jeff to talk about Amplifund. Okay, thanks, Chris. Um, Amplifund is a new system that the state is using for the GATA um, uh, process for, for grants. Uh, it's an online application for notice of funding opportunities, and it's gonna replace the PDF applications that I know all of you have been working on working with in the past and, and, and love so much. It integrates more directly with the GATA system. And one of the things that as we've been developed, working through our own uh, NOFO development here, it's gonna reduce the opportunities for application errors and forgotten or overlooked information. Um, and, it, but it, and one thing, it does not allow applications after a deadline. There's a button that will say submit at the, at the point where it's supposed to be in by. If you haven't hit that submit button, it's not going to uh, allow you to submit it. So it, that will actually um, um, end some of the uncertainty sometimes that we get where uh, maybe something looks like it came in at 12.01 or a minute after the deadline. And you know, there's questions of, did you start sending it before the 
uh, the 12 o'clock deadline. So uh, hopefully that will deal with some of those things. Uh, for Amplifund, it's, a, it's an online system. Um, you're gonna use your GATA grantee portal username and password to log into it. So it's all, um, it's all something that's gonna be integrated with, with what you have to do already. And you can start, modify, and submit applications using it. Um, this is what the new NOFO is gonna look like. Um, it's gonna be online, you find the link and it will have all the information on it. And you'll be able to uh, download it and read it and look at it. And uh, there's the application button that you'll see. Uh, but the text is gonna be similar to what you saved, it's just gonna look a little different. We've got the old uniform grant application in PDF. I know a lot of people like to look at this and it's, uh, it's always fun for us when we get the, the grant applications in to try and, and look at some of the scans or different ways. Uh, when you go into the GATA or the Amplifund system, you're going to start seeing things like this, where you have to fill in the information in those clear boxes. Um, same information, but hopefully a lot easier for you to do it. And basically, when you type it in, we don't have to retype some of it uh, when we're building it into some of the, our review systems uh, in our office. Um, once you start to get into the, the system and look at the application, you're going to be looking at like the uniform grant application here, which is standard for, for all state applications. And then uh, some of the things that we've put together for specific for 604 or 319 or GIGO. Uh, we're doing things like starting to uh, put in some more scoping questions so that you can uh, you know, answer some of these things. And so for instance, if you say none of the above, You'll get a sign that says stop, hopefully save you some time if you're not eligible for the grant. Um, so if you see something like this when you start filling in the information, that's maybe a signal to give us a call and find out, uh, are you actually eligible and figure out, you know, maybe there is uh, something else that you can click. Uh, for the project application, uh, here's an old 604 application with the PDF. You're gonna see what used to look like this, will now look more like this. And we're building in more scoping questions. So if you answer yes or no, it only opens up the sections that you have to fill out later in the application. There won't be any, do I have to fill this one out too? Uh, because there, there can sometimes be some uncertainty on that. So we're trying to reduce that. When it gets to typing your project description, rem remember always look at the, the things we're asking for, for one, two, and three, and then put it in to the project descriptions or you know, give us the information we want to see or the, the, what we're looking for. Um, we're also setting it up so that you can say, work on the application outside on a Word document and copy and paste it with formatting. Uh, so that makes it a little bit easier for you to put together and for us sometimes to, uh, to read it while we're reviewing the application. Um, we also have helpful instructions. Um, so if we're asking you to uh, put the, the scope of work in a spreadsheet, you know, download it onto your, uh, your computer, fill it out. We're gonna be giving you suggested tasks that might fit different, different things, things that we, we tend to see in these types of projects. Uh, you don't have to put these down and you're not limited to only these, but we, you know, we're trying to make you sit, think about what are some of the things that will go into it. Also, if you're doing a BMP, we're gonna ask you to give the information in some of these text boxes, some of these uh, in a particular format it, so it's easier for us to, uh, to read it. Uh, the old budget form, the one that everyone knows and loves and, and sometimes has math errors that uh, are, you, know, you may find hard to reconcile. You've got to maybe do two different types of forms and you got to double check, did I put in the right amount here or, or what? Now you're going to have something that'll look like this, where you can click on the, the plus button on the left of the different categories, and you start to put in all the information. You're going to see down near the bottom some red text. If you're not reconciled, it'll say, you know, the total overall budget cost must, must equal out. Uh, if you, in this case, you know, the, you've got to show $200,000 worth of work uh, in it. Um, so, in the old budget template, you'd see for like individual tasks, like here's personnel, you'd have to fill this out in this way and it's sometimes very complicated and hard to read. What you're gonna see now instead are 
uh, boxes that come out that you fill out with specific information. What's the salary? Is the basis of that uh, by year? What's the percentage of time? Um, is this non-grant funded? This is where you're gonna start to put in cash match or in-kind in match if, if some some cases, but it's it's hopefully gonna be a little bit easier. And, and you can't see it on this, but there's a, the narrative, there's a spot where you can type in more narrative about what that person is going to do or what the consultants or, or what goes into a specific line item. Uh, and finally, when you fill out the, the budget and you've got your consulting and your uh, personnel people in there, you're not going to see this little red text that says, you know, you, you're, uh, you've got to make sure that this equals out um, or that the amount you've got there for grant funded or not non-grant funded, the, the match uh, work, work out. As you do each section, you're going to see this little check. When you mark as complete, it will uh, put this little check up at the top of the page. And if you have not filled in all the required questions, it's going to come up with something that says, this is a required question for you to fill out. So if you go to, to hit complete and you haven't done that, it's going to tell you what you need to fill out. Uh, and only when you've got all of those, uh, those checks across the way uh, up at the top, can you hit submit. Um, and then You'll probably, before you want to submit, you want to download and review it. Uh, there's this little review button there where uh, you get to take a look at what your proposal looks like. What you see is what we're going to see. Um, so you can take a look at it. Uh, and when you're happy with it, you can submit it. Uh, hit the submit button. Uh, once it's submitted, you've got to remember it can't be changed, only withdrawn. So make sure that you've saved a copy. Uh, so you can maybe cut and paste what you've done previously in there in case you realize you missed something or you want to add something. Uh, so just be careful uh, on, on going through that because you, you can't come to us and say, can I just add this? And Because the, the answer is going to be no. Um, teams can work on this. All users tied to the organization can view and edit all open applications for an organization. Multiple users can work on that application at once. And uh, all of them have to have the GATA grantee portal credentials. Um, and you know, certain people, you can set it up so certain people can only edit, can edit or view or update on their own uh, account settings. And make sure that you know, if you've got multiple people working on it, uh, you, you might run into some problems. So make sure uh, only one person is working on it at a time. Uh, but we're going to find out more about that as as things happen with this. And so. Now, Chris, we're going to turn it, turn it back over to her to uh, talk about the application process. Thanks, Jeff. And I know everybody, we're throwing a heck of a lot of information at you. This, this webinar was really going to be a bigger picture type of thing with the idea that there's multiple webinars following to give you more information about, say, the Section 319 program or more of the amplified information here. So don't panic when you're looking at and seeing all of this information because we are available to help you. And again, we will be doing more um, webinars to provide good information there. Now, what Jeff was just showing you, Illinois EPA is just stepping into AmpliFund itself. We're using the this recent 604 application as our first attempt to get through the process. The Section 319 application will also be in AmpliFund and that should come out if things go well early May with again an application deadline of late July or early August. Again, people that know me know that I'm running significantly behind, but I'm still running. So um, what we're going to do is wrap this up with tips and tricks that you might consider. It's going to be appropriate for our applications and hopefully other grants that you're looking at. Your next slide, Jeff. Okay, so what I should have been saying there was plan and bring partners to the table. So if you've got a project that you're working on, your first step really needs to be who else is out there and can help you um, fund your project or get it implemented. Because even if you have all the money in the world and you don't have partners helping you to implement it, you may not be successful. So look at state and federal organizations and they're gonna be looking again at your watershed based plans if you have one done to see if they've got funding sources available that might be able to help you. But there's a list of some of the different groups out there that may have funding available to you. And 
if you're listening to the state and federal budgets at all these days, it's a moving target. There seems to be money seeping out from all sorts of different places. So a program that might not be available today might be available in 60 days. So keep an eye on things. Um, effective and efficient projects. When you're looking at putting something together, take a little bit of time and see if you can resolve multiple stakeholder issues such as water quality improvement, flood control and habitat enhancement. But remember that if you have a habitat enha en enhancement project that you don't have any interest in doing water quality or flood control um, and you apply for say the section 319 program which is for non-point source pollution control, it's gonna be a very low priority and isn't going to get picked for funding. Um, I'm gonna have Jeff skip to the next slide. Okay. So this is the 21 GIGO applications, and we have not um, released the next round of GIGO yet. We have to do some tweaking to the program before we did it. We had a lot of good applications that did not get funded because we didn't have enough money, but we had a lot of bad applications that didn't get funded, and these were the main reasons why. They totally missed the point of the notice of funding opportunity. They were asking for maybe replacing a parking lot versus adding stormwater storage underneath a replaced parking lot to help control stormwater runoff. They didn't get their application signed. Uh, we've got, and this will get taken care of with the Amplifund, so I should just even move that one off the list. They didn't provide the enough information or the correct information. Again, we've got a ranking criteria in the notice of funding opportunity. So if and when you're applying, look at that ranking criteria and say, hey, did I answer these questions and how many times did I answer it in the question? Um, they may have included ineligible costs or had expensive tastes. When we only have three and a half million dollars or five million dollars for one program for the entire state of Illinois, the last thing that we want is the Cadillac of projects. We want effective, we want efficient, and we want ones that we know are going to be maintained. If the local applicant wants to pay for the Cadillac portion of it, we'll pay for the tires. We're good with that. Um, they've included operation and maintenance as an after effect or an afterthought. Um, we really need people to have thought through their project and know that it's going to be able to remain in the community and be helpful to the community. Or they just weren't ready. They said, hey, I'll, I'll throw an application at it and see if it sticks. Next slide, Jeff. Okay, things to know about grant agreements. They're mostly 24 months. All work must occur within the grant period. So if say you're buying land for a wetland, but it gets bought before we get into a grant agreement, you can't use it as match and we couldn't reimburse, although we don't reimburse for land purchases. Um, the Most of our programs are reimbursement programs. So you need to have the money available and be able to spend so that we can reimburse you after it's done. Be aware of what the match requirements are. Again, Section 319 at 6040, 604, there is no match requirement. Um, move on to the next one. The IEPA does review all products for eligibility. So once you guys have done the work, we're still looking at it to make sure that you um, ended up um, in the grant agreement doing what it is that the grant agreement said. Um, the other thing is that you've got quarterly reporting, invoicing, and final reporting that has to happen. So you need to um, make sure that you account for that in your project costs if it's an eligible item. Um, I'm going to skip over the things to know about watershed-based planning because we're going to cover that in the next webinar. Um, and you guys will be able to see all of these slides in a couple of days also. So I'm going to skip over the BMP implementation. Those are helpful hints on that. Again, operation and maintenance plans. After installation, it ensures the life of the BMP. Before implementation, it's going to help you identify design flaws. It's going to save money and save frustration. You're going to educate your property owners, and it's going to reduce the surprise of your project and if it survives the 10-year minimum that we normally require for an LNA or EPA project. Go to the next slide, Jeff. Okay. Um, basically, we sign a grant agreement. If you get funded, you have to do the products that you say that you're going to do. It could include engineering designs. Any practices that are installed need a minimum of 10 years of operation and maintenance, maybe longer depending on the practice. Um, we do require quite a bit of uh, paperwork. I've heard people say that the Illinois EPA money is free money. 
I will never agree with that. We're paying for a project and you need to, in your application, make sure that your costs are somewhat covered so that you survive, but don't get too carried away again with the Cadillac of costs because then somebody else that has a similar project that came in a little bit less is gonna get selected for funding because they were doing a similar project at a reduced cost. Um, Jeff, I will have you go ahead and flip to the next slide. Okay, uh, this is just another group of people that you can look at for potential funding sites. Next slide. There are some resources on the Illinois EPA webpage and I have seen in the comments and I know from many people that I talk to, the non-point source in the watershed management section of Illinois EPA's webpage is about two years behind. It's just that we don't have enough people to do everything that we need to do. And although this sounds very simple to fix, it's a unfortunately low priority on things. We're hoping to get that corrected in the next four months. Um, next slide. I've totally run us out of time, but thank you very much for your attendance. And I think there's three minutes left. Do you have a, a few minutes for questions then, Chris? <laughs> sure. <laughs> All right. Um, one that came in early from Holly uh, regarding 319 funds is, can 319 funds be used to develop a TMDL as well as implementing a TMDL? Yes. It, it is an eligible item. It isn't something that we see very often. Okay, good to know. Um, we also had a question about the GEIGO applications. And do you know when that NOFO is gonna come out? Um, and also where can we find information about the status of grants issued under the, the 2020 call? Okay. The, I had hoped that the GEIGO, the second round of GEIGO applications would have been announced a year ago this last January. So that's how far behind I am on this. Um, I expect I go to go out sometime this summer. Um, we're looking at a longer application period and we're also looking at trying to revamp the program so that disadvantaged communities have a better chance of competing for the GEIGO fund. So we really need to look at the program as a whole, do a little bit more fixing to it before it gets released. But anybody that's on um, this mailing list or registered for this, we can add you to a list of uh, email notification of when the GEIGO no, NOFO is posted. Excellent, thank you. Um, there's a question from Jordan about reporting, let's see, section 319 biennial report and section 604B biennial reports currently on Illinois EPA's website are both dated September 2020. Um, US EPA grant reporting and tracking system doesn't include Illinois 319 grant projects for 2021. Um, are there more up-to-date reporting mechanisms that Illinois EPA is now using where people can get current information about grant projects administered in Illinois under these programs? Or will Amplifund replace these? Uh, Amplifund will not replace this. This is a staffing problem. Um, basically, we had uh, two grant managers that took 60 years of experience with them when they retired about a year ago. We've brought on new staff, we're training them, and we're trying to maintain the current grants, start the new grants, and then report on anything that's been done. And basically, that's a, a Chris Davis issue. <laughs> And that's a tough one to solve. Um, yeah. Can ARPA funds um, be used to uh, be used as match? Okay. ARPA funds, I would assume, will be considered federal funds and therefore would be available as match for the Green Infrastructure Grant Opportunities Program. But I don't believe that they would be eligible for the Federal Clean Water Act, the Section 319 fund. Excellent. Having right. said that those section 319 could match GEIGO funds. Aha, so. uh -huh. good to know. All right, I think we are at time and we are um, we have answered all our questions. Thank you so much, Chris. I, Chris and Jeff, I really appreciate your time here. Thanks for everybody who joined us today and look for us. At our next webinar will be in mid-April, um, diving deeper into these issues. Thank you so much. Thank you guys, we appreciate your time.